Will she tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present <laughs> structure. <laughs> what a good idea. <laughs> Tributes to the Right Honourable the Baroness Thatcher of Gestephen, LGOM. I call the Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I beg to move the motion. In the long history of this Parliament, Margaret Thatcher was our first and so far our only woman Prime Minister. She won three elections in a row, serving this country for a longer continuous period than any Prime Minister for more than 150 years. She defined and she overcame the great challenges of her age, and it is right that Parliament has been recalled to mark our respect. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it is also right that next Wednesday, Lady Thatcher's coffin will be draped with the flag that she loved. It will be placed on a gun carriage and taken to St Paul's Cathedral, and members of all three services will line the route. This will be a fitting salute to a great Prime Minister. Yeah. Today, we in the House of Commons are here to pay our own tributes to an extraordinary leader and an extraordinary woman. What she achieved, even before her three terms in office, was remarkable. Those of us who grew up when Margaret Thatcher was already in Downing Street can sometimes fail to appreciate the thickness of the glass ceiling that she broke through from a grocer's shop in Grantham to the highest office in the land. At a time when it was difficult for a woman to become a member of Parliament, almost inconceivable that one could lead the Conservative Party, and by her own reckoning, virtually impossible that a woman could become Prime Minister, she did all three. It is also right to remember that she spent her whole Premiership, and indeed much of her life, under direct personal threat from the IRA. She lost two of her closest friends and closest parliamentary colleagues, Airy Neve and Ian Gow, to terrorism. And of course she herself was only inches away from death in the Brighton bomb attack of 1984. And yet it was the measure of her leadership that she shook off the dust from that attack and in just a few hours later gave an outstanding conference speech reminding us all why democracy must never give in to terror. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher was a woman of great contrasts. She could be incredibly formidable in argument, yet wonderfully kind in private. In Number 10 Downing Street today, there are still people who worked with her as Prime Minister, and they talk of her fondly. One assistant tells of when she got drenched in a downpour on a trip to Cornwall, and Margaret Thatcher personally made sure she was looked after and found her herself a set of dry clothes. Of course, she did always prefer dries to wets. <laughs> On another occasion, one assistant had put in a handwritten note to Mrs Thatcher saying, please, can you re-sign this minute? Unfortunately, she had left off the hyphen, leaving a note that actually read, please, can you resign this minute? <laughs> to which the Prime Minister polite reply politely replied, thank you, dear, but I'd rather not. Margaret Thatcher was faultlessly kind to her staff and utterly devoted to her family. For more than 50 years, Dennis was always at her side, an invaluable confidant and friend. Of her, he said this, I've been married to one of the greatest women the world has ever produced. All I could produce, small as it may be, was love and loyalty. We know just how important the support of her family and friends were to Margaret. And I know that today, everyone in this House will wish to send our most heartfelt condolences to her children, Carol and Mark, to her grandchildren, and to her many, many loyal friends. Yes. She was always incredibly kind to me, and it was a huge honour to welcome her to Downing Street shortly after I became Prime Minister, something that when I started working for her in 1988, I never dreamed I would do. And Mr Speaker, as this day of tributes begins, I would like to acknowledge that there are members of here, in this House today, from all parties, who profoundly disagreed with Mrs Thatcher, 
but who've come here today willing to pay their respects. And let me say to those honourable members, your generosity of spirit does you great credit, and it speaks more eloquently than any one person can of the strength and the spirit of British statesmanship and British democracy. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher was a remarkable type of leader. She said very clearly, I am not a consensus politician, but a conviction politician. She could sum up those convictions, linked profoundly with her upbringing and values, in just a few short phrases. Sound money, strong defence, liberty under the rule of law. You shouldn't spend what you haven't earned. Governments don't create wealth, businesses do that. The clarity of these convictions was applied with great courage to the problems of the age. And the scale of her achievements is only apparent when you look back to Britain in the 1970s. Successive governments, successive governments, had failed to deal with what was beginning to be called the British disease. Appalling industrial relations, poor productivity, persistently high inflation. Though it seems absurd today, the state had got so big that it owned our airports and airline, the phones in our houses, trucks on our roads, the state even owned a removal company. The air was thick with defeatism. There was a sense that the role of government was simply to manage decline. Margaret Thatcher rejected this defeatism. She had a clear view about what needed to change. Inflation was to be controlled, not by incomes policies, but by monetary and fiscal discipline. Industries were to be set free into the private sector. Trade unions should be handed back to their members. People should be able to buy their own council homes. Success in these endeavours was never assured. Her political story was one of a perpetual battle in the country, in this place, and sometimes even in her own cabinet too. Of course her career could have taken an entirely different path. In the late 1940s, before she entered politics, the then Margaret Roberts went for a job at ICI. The personnel department rejected her application and afterwards wrote this. This woman is headstrong, obstinate and dangerously self-opinionated. <laughs> Mr Speaker, even her closest friends would agree she could be all of those things. But the point is this, she used that conviction and that resolve in the service of our country and we are all the better for that. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Margaret Thatcher was also a great parliamentarian. She loved and respected this place and was for many years its finest debater. She was utterly fastidious in her preparations. I was a junior party researcher in the 1980s and the trauma of preparation for Prime Minister's questions is still seared into my memory. Twice a week it was as if the arms of a giant octopus shook every building in Whitehall for every analysis of every problem, every answer to every question. And her respect for Parliament was instilled into others. Early in her first government, a junior minister was seen running through the lobby. His hair was dishevelled and he was carrying both a heavy box and a full tray of papers on his arm. Another member cried out, slow down, Rome wasn't built in a day. To which the minister replied, yes, but Margaret Thatcher wasn't the foreman on that job. <laughs> As Tony Blair rightly, in my view, said this week, Margaret Thatcher was one of the very few leaders who changed not only the political landscape in their own country, but in the rest of the world too. She was no starry-eyed internationalist, but again her approach was rooted in some simple and clear principles. Strength abroad begins with strength at home. Deterrence, not appeasement. The importance of national sovereignty, which is why she fought so passionately for Britain's interests in Europe, and always believed that Britain should keep its own currency. Above all, she believed to the core of her being that Britain stood for something in the world, for democracy, for the rule of law, for right over might. She loathed communism and believed in the invincible power of the human spirit to resist and ultimately defeat tyranny. She never forgot that Warsaw, Prague, Budapest, these were great European cities, capitals of free nations, temporarily trapped behind the Iron Curtain. Today, in different corners of the world, there are millions of people who know that they owe their freedom, in part, to Margaret Thatcher. 
in Kuwait, which she helped free from Saddam's jackboot, across Eastern and Central Europe, and of course, in the Falkland Islands. In a week from now, as people gather in London to lay Margaret Thatcher to rest, the sun will be rising over the Falklands. And because of her courage, and because of the skill and bravery and sacrifice of our armed forces, it will rise again for freedom. Mr Speaker, much has been said about the battles that Margaret Thatcher fought. She certainly did not shy from the fight, and that led to arguments, to conflict, yes, even to division. But what is remarkable, looking back now, is how many of those arguments are no longer arguments at all. No one wants to return to strikes without a ballot. No one believes that large industrial companies should be owned by the state. The nuclear deterrent, NATO, the special relationship, these are widely accepted as the cornerstones of our security and defence policies. We argue, sometimes very passionately, in this House about tax, but none of us is arguing for a return to tax rates of 98%. So many of the principles that Lady Thatcher fought for are now part of the accepted political landscape of our country. As Winston Churchill once put it, there are some politicians who make the weather, and Margaret Thatcher was undoubtedly one of them. Mr Speaker, in the members' lobby of the House of Commons, there are rightly four principal statues. Lloyd George, who gave us the beginnings of the welfare state. Winston Churchill, who gave us victory in war. Clement Attlee, who gave us the NHS. And Margaret Thatcher, who rescued our country from post-war decline. They say, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Well, in 1979 came the hour and came the lady. She made the political weather. She made history. And let this be her epitaph, that she made our country great again. And I commend this motion to the House. Yeah. Order. The question is that this House has considered the matter of tributes to the Right Honourable the Baroness Thatcher of Kestephen LG. Oh, um, Mr. Edward Miliband. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I want to join the Prime Minister in commemorating the extraordinary life and unique contribution of Margaret Thatcher. And I want to join him in sending my deepest condolences to her children, Carol and Mark, the whole family, and her many, many close friends. Today is an opportunity for us to reflect on Margaret Thatcher's personal achievements, her style of politics, and her political legacy. And as the Prime Minister said, the journey from being the child of a grocer to Downing Street is an unlikely one. And it is particularly remarkable because she was the daughter, not the son, of a grocer. At each stage of her life, she broke the mould. A woman at Oxford, when there was not a single woman in the university who held a full professorship. A woman chemist, when most people assumed scientists had to be men. A woman candidate for Parliament in 1950, against the opposition of some in her local party in Dartford at the age of only 24. A woman MP in 1959 when just 4% of MPs in the whole of this House were women. The only woman in the Cabinet when she was appointed in 1970. And of course, the first woman Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, it is no wonder she remarked as early as 1965 in a speech to the National Union of Town Women's Guilds Conference in politics, if you want anything said, ask a man. If you want anything done, ask a woman. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure some people in this house... I was going to say, Mr Speaker, I'm sure some people in this house, and no doubt many more in the country, will agree with this sentiment. <laughs> Having broken so many conventions as a woman, it can't be a coincidence that she was someone who in so many other areas of life was willing to take on the established orthodoxies. Margaret Thatcher's ability to overcome every obstacle in her path is just one measure of her personal strength. And that takes me to her style of politics. You can disagree with Margaret Thatcher, but it is important to understand the kind of political leader she was. What was unusual was that she sought to be rooted in people's daily lives, but she also believed that ideology mattered. Not for her the contempt sometimes heaped on ideas and new thinking in political life. 
And while she never would have claimed to be or wanted to be seen as an intellectual, she believed and she showed that ideas matter in politics. In 1945, Mr. Speaker, before the end of the war, she bought a copy of Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom. There is even a story that she suggested that Conservative Central Office distributed in the 1945 general election campaign. She said it left a permanent mark on my political character. And nobody can grasp Margaret Thatcher's achievements and Thatcherism without also appreciating the ideas that were its foundation. And the way in which they departed from the prevailing consensus of the time. In typical homespun style, on breakfast TV, she said this in 1995. Consensus doesn't give you any direction. It is like mixing all the constituent ingredients together and not coming out with a cake. <laughs> Democracy is about the people being given a choice. It was that approach that enabled her to, enabled her to define the politics of a whole generation and influence the politics of generations to come. The Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and I all came of age in the 1980s when you defined your politics by being for or against what she was doing. It's fair to say we took different paths. <laughs> 30 years on, the people of Britain still argue about her legacy. She was right to understand the sense of aspiration of people across the country. She was right to recognise our economy needed to change. She said in 1982 how absurd it will seem in a few years' time that the state ran Pickford's removals and the Glen Eagles Hotel. She was right. And in foreign policy, she was right to defend the Falklands and bravely reach out to new leadership in the Soviet Union. And something often forgotten, Mr Speaker, she was the first political leader in any major country to warn of the dangers of climate change. Long before anyone thought of hugging a husky. <laughs> but, but, but it would be dishonest, but it would be dishonest and not in keeping with the principles that Margaret Thatcher stood for, even on this day, not to be open with this House about the strong opinions and the deep divisions there were and are over what she did. In mining areas like the one I represent, communities felt angry and abandoned. Gay and lesbian people felt stigmatised by measures like Section 28, which today's Conservative Party has rightly repudiated. And it was no accident that when he became leader of the Conservative Party, the Right Honourable Member for Chingford wrote a pamphlet called There Is Such a Thing as Society. And on the world stage, as this Prime Minister rightly said in 2006 when he was leader of the opposition, she made the wrong judgement about Nelson Mandela and about sanctions in South Africa. Mr Speaker, debates about her and what she represented will continue for many years to come. This is a mark of her significance as a political leader. Someone with deep convictions, willing to act on them. As she put it, politics is more when you have convictions than a matter of multiple manoeuvrings to get you through the problems of the day. And as a person, nothing became her so much as the manner of her final years. The loss of her beloved husband, Dennis, and her struggle with illness. She bore both with the utmost dignity and courage. The same courage she showed decades earlier after the atrocity of the Brighton bombing. And Mr Speaker, I will always remember seeing her at the Cenotaph in frail health, but determined to pay her respects to our troops and do her duty by the country. Whatever your view of her, Margaret Thatcher was a unique and towering figure. I disagree with much of what she did but I respect what her death means to the many, many people who admired her. And I honour her personal achievements. On previous occasions, we have come to this House to remember the extraordinary Prime Ministers who have served our nation. Today we also remember a Prime Minister who defined her age. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Mr. John Redwood. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it is a pleasure to rise so soon after two such outstanding speeches. Uh, and on behalf of the House, I pay tribute to both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. They captured the essence of Margaret Thatcher, the woman 
and the essence of Margaret Thatcher, the politician and stateswoman, and we are in their debt for getting our, our day off to such a superb start. I wish to be brief, but I would just like to put on record that she was the best boss I ever worked for. Uh, I was her chief policy advisor in, in the middle years, and then I subsequently was able to advise and help her a bit as a member of parliament and a, a junior minister. And she was that, that great figure because the private side of Margaret Thatcher was so different from the public side. Yes, many people beyond this house remember the woman who was so powerful in argument, who was so fierce in conviction. But what we saw, who, who worked with her closely, was someone who worked incredibly long hours with great energy and diligence because she was so keen to get it right. And she took a very wide range of advice. When you were working with Margaret Thatcher and you, you had an idea and you were putting it to her, not only did you need to produce all the evidence and the facts and go over it many times, but you knew that person after person coming to Downing Street was going to be given it as a kind of test. And they didn't know that they were part of a sort of running focus group, but your idea was there in front of the guests uh, and they were asked to shoot it down because she was so desperately concerned never to use the power of the great office without proper thought. And she was also so keen to make sure that before she did anything, she knew what the criticisms were going to be, she knew what might go wrong with it, she had tested it to destruction. And there's a lot to, to recommend it for those who are making mighty decisions, uh, that they spend time, they take trouble, uh, they go to a wide range of advice and they make sure that something works well before it is, is put out there. Margaret Thatcher came in the middle of, of her period in office uh, to be the champion of wider ownership and wider participation. And this, to me, was her at her best uh, when she could reach out beyond the, the confines of the Conservative Party she led so well in those days and beyond the, the confines of her <coughs> fairly solid 40% of voting support much wider in the country. And a Prime Minister can become a great national leader when their ideas resonate more widely and when they become popular or they become taken up uh, by those who would normally oppose. And it was that spirit of Margaret Thatcher which had fought her way uh, as a, a schoolgirl to Oxford and then as an Oxford graduate to Parliament and then as a parliamentarian to the Cabinet that made her feel that opportunity was there for people but she recognised that it was very difficult, particularly for women, very difficult for people from certain backgrounds. And she was always telling us that it didn't matter where you came from, who your mother and father was, what mattered was what you could contribute. And that surely is a message that goes way beyond the confines of the Conservative Party or the years of her supremacy in Parliament. And it is something we should all remember. And when we tried to produce policies to reflect this more generally, we came up with the idea that uh, owning a home had been the privilege of the richer part of society. And why couldn't it be something that everyone could aspire to, or practically everyone could aspire to? And that was where the council house sale idea yeah. gathered momentum. I know there were many people in the early days on the Labour benches who were very unhappy about this, and there still remain debates about it, but an awful lot of Labour voters and even some Labour councillors decided it was a really good policy and joined us with it, and I think it was one of those policies that reached out so much more widely. We tried to extend it into the ownership of big and small businesses uh, with a big programme of wider share ownership uh, and the employee elements and the public elements in the, the great privatisations because she was determined to try and get Britain to break out of the debilitating cycle of decline that we would witnessed under Labour and Conservative governments in the post-war years. Uh, just one fact that the House might like to bear in mind for those who are very worried by the depressing number of jobs lost in the 1980s in the pits and in the steel industry is that the newly nationalised coal industry in the early 1950s had 700,000 employees and by the time Margaret Thatcher came to office in 1979 there were only 235,000 of those jobs left. There had been a massive hemorrhage of jobs throughout the post-war period uh, and similar figures uh, could be adduced for rail and for steel and the other commanding heights. It was that which drove her on to say there must be a better answer. There must be a way of modernising the old industries and bringing in the new industries. And one of her legacies is the modernisation of the car industry which then gathered momentum under the Labour government and more recently under the coalition. 
Uh, her other great triumph, I think, as the Prime Minister mentioned, was to extend this argument to a much wider audience around the world. And it was the, the export of the ideas of empowerment, enfranchisement, participation, of breaking industries up, of allowing competition and new ideas, allowing the public to be part of this process, which took off around the world and lay behind a lot of the, the spirit of revolution in Eastern Europe, uh, which led to the bringing down of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, yeah. And I think if we want a, a single picture that I will remember, uh, as a result of the Thatcher legacy, it is the tumbling of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. The realisation yeah. that the path of enterprise and freedom adopted by all the democratic parties in this House is the right approach and that tyranny and communism doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. So, Mr Speaker, a great lady, a great stateswoman, a huge personal achievement, a very big achievement politically, and at its best an achievement which broke free from conservatism, which broke free from party dogma, and showed the world that there is a better way, a democratic way, a freedom-loving way. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Nick Clegg. Yeah. Uh, on, on behalf of the Liberal Democrats, I'd like to pay tribute to uh, Lady Thatcher. We send our sincere condolences to her family and friends, in particular her children Mark and Carol. Like all of us here, Mr Speaker, who are not members of the Conservative Party and as someone who disagreed with many of the things she did, I thought long and hard about what to say. I'm also a, a Sheffield MP, a city where the mere mention of her name even now elicits strong reactions. Mr Speaker, I'd like to uh, think she'd perhaps be pleased that she still provokes trepidation and uncertainty amongst leaders of other parties, even when she's not here herself, eyeballing us across the, across the House. Mr Speaker, that those of us who are not from her party can shun the tenets of Thatcherism and yet still respect Margaret Thatcher is part of what was so remarkable about her. And it is in that spirit that I'd like to make three short observations. First whether, first, whether you liked her or disliked her, it is impossible to deny the indelible imprint Margaret Thatcher made both on the nation and the wider world. She was among those very rare leaders who became a towering historical figure, not as written in the history books, but when still in the prime of her political life. Whatever else is said about her, Margaret Thatcher created a paradigm, setting the parameters for economic, political and social debate for decades to come. She drew the lines on a political map that we here are still navigating today. Second, she was one of the most caricatured figures in modern British politics, yet she was easily one of the most complex. On the one hand, she is remembered as the eponymous ideologue, responsible for her own ism. Yet in reality, much of her politics was subtle, pragmatic, sometimes driven by events. Margaret Thatcher was a staunch patriot and much more comfortable reaching out across the Atlantic than across the Channel. Yet she participated in one of the most profound periods of European integration, she herself an architect of the single market. And while she was a conservative to her core, leading a party which traditionally likes to conserve things, she held a deep aversion to the status quo. She was restive about the future, determined to use politics as a force for reform, never fearing short-term disruption in pursuit of long-term change. In many ways a traditionalist, she was one of the most iconoclastic politicians of our age. So Margaret Thatcher was far from the cardboard cutout that is sometimes imagined. And for me, the best tribute to her is not to consign her to a simplified heroine or villain, but to remember her with all the nuance, unresolved complexity and paradox she possessed. Finally, Mr Speaker, there was an extraordinary, even unsettling directness about her political presence. I remember vividly, age 20, reading that Margaret Thatcher had said that there was no such thing as society. I was dismayed. It was not the kind of thing that a wide-eyed, idealistic social anthropology undergraduate wanted to hear. But with hindsight, what strikes me is that while I disagreed with the untempered individualism which those words implied, I never for a second thought that she was being cynical or that she was striking a pose or taking a position for short-term effect. You always knew with Margaret Thatcher that she believed what she said. It is interesting, Mr Speaker, to reflect on how she would have reacted to today's political culture of 24-hour news, pollsters and focus groups. 
she seemed blissfully indifferent to the popularity of what she said, entirely driven instead by the conviction of what she said. Somehow her directness made you feel as if she was arguing directly with you, as if it was a clash of her convictions against yours. And as a result, you somehow felt as if you knew her, even if you did not. Whether she inspired or confronted, led or attacked, she did it all with uncluttered clarity. Mr Speaker, her memory will no doubt continue to divide opinion and stir deep emotion. But as we as a nation say farewell to a figure who looms so large, one thing's for sure. The memory of her will continue undimmed, strong and clear for years to come, in keeping with the unusual, unique character of Margaret Thatcher herself. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I begin by, on behalf of my right honourable and honourable friends, uh, wishing uh, our deepest sympathies to the family of Baroness Thatcher, to her children and to her grandchildren. I want to thank you, Mr Speaker, also for recalling Parliament is the right thing to do in this chamber which she dominated for so long that we, the representatives of the people of the United Kingdom, should meet here to pay tribute but also to reflect on her long period in office. Uh, Baroness Thatcher was many things, uh, Mr Speaker. She was a pioneer, as has been said, the first female leader <coughs> of a major political party in the United Kingdom and the first female Prime Minister. She did break that glass ceiling, but she also broke through the social barrier standing in the way of anyone in that time and generation from becoming the leader of a major political party. She was a woman of personal and political courage, a politician of formidable ability, but a stateswoman who transformed not only the United Kingdom but also paid an enormous, or played an enormous role in changing fundamentally the world order. Of course there are many who disagreed with her, even within her own party and those of us who are unionists in Northern Ireland disagreed with her on occasions, particularly in relation to the Anglo-Irish agreement. <coughs> but whatever our views, people today, by and large, must accept, acknowledge and admire her as a politician, a statesperson of conviction. For her, the days of focus groups, the amorphous middle, the soft imaging, none of that would have suited her. How many times have we heard it said during her lifetime and since, that like her or loather, at least you knew where Maggie stood. And people admire that in their politicians. And that's uh, certainly something that people want to see. Part of her attraction was that she was seen as taking on the vested interest, the political establishment. She was impatient of the old brigade, prepared to shake things up. But like all great human beings and all great politicians, she was a woman of contradictions. Very often her rhetoric didn't match up to the actions. Her instincts were blunted. She did become persuaded on some issues against her better judgment. On Europe she is rightly lauded for the actions she took, for instance, in relation to securing our rebate, for her stance against European federalism, for her Bruges speech, for her stance in defence of our currency. And yet she did sign and implement the single European Act, which many see as the forerunner of the Maastricht Agreement and on Northern Ireland. Again, she was full of contradictions. Those of us in these benches in the DUP and indeed the entire unionist community in Northern Ireland in the 80s opposed the Anglo-Irish Agreement and indeed many honourable and right honourable members on the Conservative benches and others opposed it as well. Once she had said that Ulster was as British as Finchley, once she said rightly that it was out, out, out to a united Ireland, a federal Ireland or joint authority. And yet a year later, in 1985, she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement without any consultation with the entire unionist community and without their consent. The reason that so many unionists felt so strongly and spoke so strongly at that time and that there are still strong feelings about that era is that they remembered her strong stance during the hunger strikes when she stood up in defence of democracy and against terrorism when she had suffered the loss as the Prime Minister and others have referred to of her close colleagues due to terrorism when she herself just a year before had survived an IRA assassination attempt and yet she was persuaded to sign the Anglo-Irish Agreement 
I am glad that in her later life she came to recognize that that was a mistake. But just as Lord Powell, her former close advisor, said the other night in Newsnight, it said of, one of, uh, of, of Mary, Queen of Scots, that the words Calais were inscribed in her heart. So he believed that the words the Anglo-Irish Agreement would be inscribed in the heart of Margaret Thatcher because she became increasingly disillusioned with that agreement. People say, but was it not the template for the future that we now have in Ulster? I say it isn't that template because you can't base a future on exclusion. And I say that as a unionist in Northern Ireland with all of our history. We must go forward with the inclusion of all communities. And today there's very little of the Anglo-Irish agreement left. Today we have a settlement in Northern Ireland which has been consulted and has the consent and agreement of both communities in Northern Ireland. And I'm glad that that is now what we have as opposed to the previous approach. Mr Speaker, I want to close by saying <coughs> that we had our disagreements, yes, with Margaret Thatcher, but she was fundamentally, instinctively and truly a great patriot, a great unionist, a great Briton. And that is why we are right to pay tribute to her today, recognising her faults, recognising the divisions that are there, of course, there are divisions, but there were divisions long before Margaret Thatcher and there will be divisions long after in other eras as well. It is you're not unique. I hear today Gerry Adams and others talk about the legacy of Margaret Thatcher as if she and the British government, the British state, created the violence in Northern Ireland. The fact is, of course, that the hunger strikers were in jail and were convicted of terrorist acts long before she came to office. And those who are out on our streets in Belfast and elsewhere in the United Kingdom, in Glasgow, Bristol or wherever it is, engaging in the sort of ghoulish celebrations, obscene acts which I think appall the entire nation. They should think again of her words because she once said that she took great solace in those who hated her so much because she knew then that she was doing what was right and that they hated her for that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we must remember uh, Margaret Thatcher for the great things that she has done for our country, not remembering her with, with rose-tinted spectacles or through rose-tinted spectacles, especially those of us in Ulster. But it is right that we do mark her period in office and her life has been one of enormous contribution, an everlasting memorial to democracy and to freedom in this country and across the world. Sir Malcolm Rifkin. I, I was uh, privileged along with my right honourable friend, the member for Rushcliffe, uh, to serve in Margaret Thatcher's government for the full 11 years of her term of office and to be in her cabinet for almost half that time. And, you know, it was never dull. <laughs> Each day we saw political leadership and statesmanship of the highest order. And each day we saw a Prime Minister with remarkable personal qualities. It was sometimes said that she didn't have a sense of humour. And it's true, there was very little wit in many of her speeches. But I recall on one occasion uh, she was asked, uh, Mrs Thatcher, do you believe in consensus? And to our surprise we heard her saying, yes I do believe in consensus. There should be a consensus behind my convictions. <laughs> I thought at the time this was an extraordinary example of wit, but as the years have gone by I've realised that she was actually... <laughs> she was actually being deadly serious. It was also said that she could be very intolerant with those who didn't agree with her. That was also a parody of the, of the truth. She was intolerant of people who were woolly, who argued that things couldn't be done because they'd be unpopular, uh, or that it was too difficult. But when she met someone who actually was able to argue from a point of fact and whom she respected, uh, then she not only listened and could change her mind. Uh, I was moved to the Foreign Office uh, at the time of the Falklands, and uh, she recalled Sir Anthony Parsons, our ambassador at the Security Council, to ask him how it was going at the United Nations. He'd never met her before. He was a rather grand uh, diplomat. And when he started trying to report to her, she, not uncharacteristically, kept interrupting him. 
and he wasn't used to this. And after the fourth interruption, he stopped and he said, Prime Minister, if you didn't interrupt me so often, you might find that you didn't need to. <laughs> she not only kept quiet, but six months later appointed him her foreign policy advisor. <laughs> now, of course, she was a great leader of the Conservative Party. <coughs> but, you know, people are entitled to ask, was she actually a Conservative? Doesn't the word Conservative normally mean someone who is rather wedded to tradition, cautious of change, unwilling to act too precipitately? And yet she was the most radical Prime Minister of the last few generations. There is nevertheless a consistency between these two statements. Because what she had recognised was that Britain had gone the wrong way, it had taken the wrong path for 20 or 30 years and that needed change. And that's what made her radical. Uh, many honourable members will know that great novel, The Leopard, by Giuseppe de Lampedusa, where the hero says, if you want things to stay the same, things will have to change. And that very much was her belief. I uh, am conscious of the fact, having spent a lot of my time in the Foreign Office, that diplomats in the Foreign Office were not her favourite department. I went to see her when I was Defence Secretary some years later, after she had retired, and she said to me, you know, Ministry of Defence, your problem is you've got no allies. The Foreign Office, she said, they're not wet, they're drenched. <laughs> she had a remarkable capacity when it came to for the Foreign Office and to diplomats, sometimes to distance herself from the government of which she was Prime Minister. On one glorious occasion which I was personally involved in, uh, we'd had a difficult negotiation getting a package of sanctions against South Africa, which did not include economic sanctions, uh, but she was very unhappy that one of the proposals at the European Community Council uh, was that we should withdraw our defence attaches. The Ministry of Defence didn't mind, but it took an awful long time for Geoffrey Howe to persuade her to go along with this, and she really was basically unconvinced, but went along with it. Some weeks later, we had a visit from the President of Mozambique, and I was asked to sit in on the meeting at Downing Street, and the President uh, rebuked her for not doing enough against apartheid in South Africa. Now, I'll never forget her response. She, got, she bridled. She said, uh, Mr. President, that is simply not uh, the case. Uh, we are uh, refusing to sell arms to South Africa. We have initiated the Glen Eagles Agreement, whereby we don't have any sporting contact with South Africa. We're using all the diplomatic means to try and bring down apartheid. We, we, we. And then suddenly she stopped, pointed at me and said, they've decided to withdraw our defence attacks. <laughs> Adding the words, don't know what good that will do, but... <laughs> And the President of Mozambique was rather bemused at what it would seem to be happening. But although she may have had mixed feelings about the Foreign Office, actually she owed a great debt of uh, gratitude to the Foreign Office. Because one of her greatest triumphs, her relationship with Mr Gorbachev and what flowed from that, was as a result of the diplomats in the Foreign Office spotting at a very early stage that this youngest new member of the Politburo, Mikhail Gorbachev, was a man to try and cultivate. And she had the wisdom to accept their advice, and what followed from that we should not underestimate. Because what followed from that, and the way in which she persuaded uh, Ronald Reagan to accept her view that Gorbachev was a man with whom we could do business, Gorbachev would not, uh, Reagan, forgive me, would not have accepted that advice from most people. But coming from the Iron Lady, he said, well, if she believes that, then I can proceed on that basis. And the result was not only a remarkable set of initiatives, but the end of the Cold War and the liberation of Eastern Europe yeah. without a shot yeah. being yeah. fired. Yeah. And that was a remarkable epitaph. I don't want to speak for too long. I just want to make one other point, though. And it is this, that one of the big issues is relevant to the debates we have today, is that in the relationship with the United States, do British Prime Ministers have to always agree with the President, no. otherwise we risk that relationship? Well, all I can tell you is Margaret Thatcher had no doubt the answer was no, you don't have to. <laughs> On several occasions, she had deep disagreements with Ronald Reagan, one of her closest friends. Uh, for example, on the question of the Soviet oil pipeline in the early 1980s, where British companies had got contracts to help build it, the Americans threatened sanctions against British companies. And Margaret Thatcher bitterly criticised them. I was sent off to Washington as a junior minister to have meetings with Mr. Kenneth Dam, the American Deputy Secretary of State. We reached a compromise. The only thing we couldn't agree on was whether the compromise would be known as the Rifkin Dam Agreement or the Dam Rifkin Agreement. <laughs> <laughs> so 
she openly and publicly disagreed with uh, Reagan on the Reykjavik summit when she felt he was surrendering too many nuclear weapons without getting enough in return. But most con important of all, she bitterly resented the invasion of Grenada. Yeah, yeah. 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 You recall, the House will recall, that Grenada was invaded by the United States, who had forgotten, unfortunately, that Her Majesty was the head of state of Grenada, and had not even informed the British government of what they were about to do. And she not only criticised them, but she went on the BBC World Service attacking the United States, saying they cannot behave like this. And some days later, Reagan recorded in his memoirs, he was sitting in the Oval Office with some of his aides and he was told the British Prime Minister was on the phone, would he take a call? And of course he said, yes, of course he would. And she started uh, berating him in a rather strident <laughs> way uh, down the telephone. It only went on for about a minute, but some of us who've been on the receiving end knows how long that can feel like. <laughs> and when he, she was in full flight, Reagan put his hand over the receiver so she couldn't hear, turned to his aides and said, gee, isn't she marvellous? <laughs> From resenting it, they of course appreciated that sometimes you get it wrong and even your closest allies are entitled to point that out. I conclude by saying that Margaret Thatcher was someone who did not worry, as has been already remarked, uh, on people being rude about her. Uh, the term Iron Lady was first coined by the Soviets as an insult and she of course took it on as a badge of pride. Dennis Healy referred to her memorably as Attila the Hen. <laughs> Uh, François Mitterrand famously said she had the eyes of Caligula and the lips of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, she took them all as a compliment uh, because she asked for no quarter and she certainly gave none. Uh, I shall next uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday in two days time, uh, next week, forgive me, next week be at the funeral in St. Paul's. Uh, I was at Churchill's funeral in St. Paul's. Well that's not quite the whole truth. I was actually an 18-year-old student who had uh, hitchhiked down to London, spent the night on the pavement and watched uh, the arrival at St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, we will honour the other great Prime Minister uh, of the last 50, 60, 70 years, Margaret Thatcher, in a similar way. Uh, and that is something which not only we can be proud of, the country can be proud of, but the whole world has, has a debt to her, which they very fully recognise as well. Yeah. Robertson. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to make a brief contribution. It's right to acknowledge that Margaret Thatcher was one of the most formidable politicians of recent times. To her family, to her friends, to her colleagues, to her supporters, I extend the condolences of the Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru. It would be wrong, however, not to put on record our profound disagreement with her socially and economic divisive policies, which were particularly opposed in Scotland and Wales. We will never forget, we will never forgive the poll tax being imposed on Scots a year before the rest of the UK. No country should have such policies imposed on them when they were rejected at the ballot box, and the existence of the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh National Assembly follows this experience. Margaret Thatcher will be remembered for a long time in Scotland and Wales. She helped remind us that we have a national consensus that values society, values solidarity and values community. For that at least, we can be grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Peter Lilly. <laughs> Mr Speaker, for those of us who worked with, loved and admired Mrs Thatcher, her death is immensely sad. But there's one small compensation, and that is she leaves immensely vivid memories. So vigorous, energetic, and decisive was her personality that she is unforgettable, not just to those of us who worked with her, but to everybody in the country who was there at the time. I first worked for her as a humble speechwriter long before I entered into Parliament or became a minister and eventually joined her cabinet. And my most personal memories conflict with the caricature that's been built up over time as much by her friends as by her opponents. Firstly, she was immensely kind. The less important you were, the kinder you, she was to you. She gave her ministers a pretty hard time and quite right too. I remember an occasion where she'd returned from three days abroad with little sleep 
and uh, I've been summoned to help on some speech in my role as a minor a cog in her speechwriting machine, and she gave a tore off uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer a strip before noticing me and deducing from the fact that I was wearing a black tie that I'd been to a funeral and was immediately full of solicitude for me in marked contrast to her uh, tearing off of her senior minister. Third, she could be remarkably diplomatic, not least in how she handled uh, those who worked for her. Uh, as a junior Treasury Minister, I once ventured to uh, disagree with the policy of a Minister of, uh, Secretary of State, and we were summoned before her to argue our respective cases out. I thought my arguments were overwhelmingly uh, the, com the better of the two, but she summed up in favour of the Secretary of State and subsequently sent a private message to me saying, Peter, I was impressed by your arguments, but it would have been quite wrong for me to overrule a senior minister in favour of a junior minister over a matter that was not of paramount importance. Yeah, yeah. And she was right. Of course, she was very cautious. Again, in contrast to the idea that's been, uh, the legend that's been built up that she recklessly took on all comers. She deferred uh, at the expense of a humiliating settlement with uh, Arthur Scargill in her first parliament, a confrontation in order that Nigel Lawson should be able to build up her coal stocks and should another com um, confrontation come, as indeed it did, uh, the nation would not be held at ransom. Her trade union reforms were implemented bit by bit, progressively, step by step. And whenever she felt she'd bitten off as enough for a parliament, she would polite, politely reject uh, proposals for further reform, however much they appealed to her. But once convinced that a policy was right in principle, workable in practice, and elaborated in detail, of which she had a masterly grasp while still maintaining a focus on the central issues, she would push it through with unswerving tenacity. Now, it's probably not done on these occasions, actually to face up to some of the uh, criticisms that have been made of her. But Mrs Thatcher was never one to be limited by what is the done thing. Uh, and uh, I want, if I may, to uh, respond to the points that have been made more in the media, but thus by the previous speaker, that she was deliberately harsh and divisive. Harsh. She made us face reality. And reality was harsh. Those who did not like facing reality projected their hatred of reality onto her. But the human cost of facing up to reality would have been much less if previous governments of both parties had not, for a mixture of uh, false analysis and cowardice, failed to, stay, uh, to uh, stand up to those realities and uh, deal with them earlier on. If blame is due, it's due to her predecessors rather than her that that harshness uh, materialised. So those who hated reality transposed their hate to her. Those who hated being proved wrong transfer their hatred to her. Those who hated seeing their illusions shattered transferred their hatred to her. Fortunately, she was big enough and strong enough to act as a lightning rod for their feelings. But the second uh, adjective which was used of her this morning by the BBC in its uh, headline news, probably tells us more about the BBC yeah. than it does about her, is the word divisive, a divisive leader. A strange uh, epithet because, of course, for any division there have to be two sides and no mention is made of those who were opposing the changes which proved so necessary. But it's stranger still in that her greatest success by her own admission was converting her opponents to her uh, way of seeing things. Yeah. Not a single one of the major measures she introduced was subsequently repealed or reversed by those who followed with her. Indeed, she has the extraordinary achievement of uniting all parties in this house behind a new paradigm. Before she came along, 
the assumption was all problems could best be solved by top-down direction and control of the state. She introduced the idea that actually quality and efficiency are most likely to follow if people are free to choose between alternatives. <laughs> and that is now, I'm happy to say, a model that's been adopted by the other parties and after a faltering start was implemented by Tony Blair even in the public services where she had feared to yeah. step. So far from being harsh in herself, or divisive. She was someone who actually leaves a legacy which unites us all. And it behooves us on a day like this to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Very much, Mr. Speaker. And I rise to sympathise with Baroness Thatcher's family and friends and colleagues in this House and elsewhere. And to them I offer my profound condolences. But I rise, Mr. Speaker, as a proud Irish nationalist, in the proud tradition of O'Connell and Parnell, and in the positive political tradition of my own predecessors, John Hume, Seamus Mallon and Eddie McGrady. This is a solemn day, and it's with solemnity and sincerity that I speak on behalf of democratic Irish nationalism. I acknowledge the wide range of contributions across this House. It is clear from some of these testimonies that there was a side to Baroness Thatcher that those who personally knew her saw and cherished her for. I am not here to deny or counter those personal truths, but as a democratic Irish nationalist I must speak with sincerity and honesty about the political contribution and the legacy. She herself always expected and respected candour. Not to register our differences with our politics and approach would be a dereliction of responsibility. Many have said in the earlier contributions that Baroness Thatcher in many ways made a divisive political contribution and has left a divisive legacy in Britain. That too is the case in Ireland. She was a formidable lady. She was a formidable politician and only a formidable politician could have made the breakthrough that she made. That cannot be denied. But neither can it be denied that there was great pain. She caused great pain and hurt and distress in Northern Ireland. She was ill-advised that the very deep political issue, driven by injustices, many injustices in Ireland, could be solved purely by military and security methods alone. Her policy and her approach to hunger strikes hardened and polarised moderate opinion and demonstrated a lack of knowledge of the island of Ireland and our peoples there. Her actions proved counterproductive to our own very cause, time and time again, handing the IRA political propaganda victories after political propaganda victories. The culture of collusion within the security service and the license that it had from government was also a major problem. The fact that at time concerns were raised by the SDLP and rubbished and dismissed didn't lessen them. Yet, these have subsequently been vindicated by De Silva and many police ombudsman reports. But all these things served to further harden and alienate constitutional nationalist opinion, but has left many questions, much hurt and a legacy that remains to this day. A large part of that unfinished legacy is how we have to deal, how we must deal with the past, and how we have to help the many victims, not just in Ireland, but on this side of the Irish Sea as well. Though the quest for truth therein will go on, our difficulties and differences politically didn't stop on the shores of these islands. We held not only a different outlook on Europe, the SDLP also opposed the resistance to challenging the apartheid regime in South Africa. We disagreed with the attitude towards the ANC and opposed the criminalisation of Nelson Mandela. I note in the last few days that the ANC have displayed a great humanity in their response mm -hmm. to the death of Baroness Thatcher. <coughs> and that's the a humanity I would join in solidarity with. Mm -hmm. History though, and we can deal with the many difficulties and many differences, showed that the signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement by Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister and Gareth Richard as Taoiseach was a pivotal and defining moment in our shared history. Indeed, a pivotal moment in changing the direction of our relationships on these islands. 
period. It was the first significant agreement between Ireland and Britain since the Treaty of 1921 and laid the foundations for the peace process and much of the progress that has taken place in the last 27 years. It changed forever the relationships between our two countries and laid the foundation for so many of the positive changes that we have experienced since. It is poignant today that today is the 15th anniversary of the signing of the Belfast Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement. That effort involved building layers upon layers of understanding. And moving on from that agreement in the last 15 years has involved building more layers of understanding. But Mr Speaker, we have to agree that the bedrock and the foundation for all that has been achieved was that Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985. The signing of that agreement showed that Baroness Thatcher did at times listen to good advice, as some have said earlier, from her advisers, and she also listened to her friends, friends, formidable friends like President Ronald Reagan in the US. But just as <coughs> Prime Minister Thatcher may not have recognised the malignant and hardening and polarising effect of her policy and attitude towards hunger strikes, she may not have appreciated or recognised the potential benign and long-term softening effect on further relationships and future relationships of our commitment in that Anglo-Irish agreement. In placing our problem in these islands in a British-Irish context, the Anglo-Irish agreement changed the traditional un challenged the un traditional unionist mindset and equipped political constitutional nationalism to make an even more compelling case against the violence to those who were engaged in violence and indeed I believe it laid the foundation for stopping the violence in Ireland. The pages at that stage were turned into a new history, the beginning of a new history in Northern Ireland and with it a new history and these islands as a whole. The benefits of the Anglo-Irish and Good Friday Agreement are being reaped today by the peoples of Britain and Ireland who continue to benefit from the positive engagement that started with and continues to flow from Baroness Thatcher's signing of the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Baroness Thatcher may not have recognised the full effect of that moment in history, but it is right that I, on behalf of Irish nationalism, recognise that today, just as the SDLP did recognise at the time of the passing of Dr Gareth Fitzgerald. I join others in this House, across this House, the President of Ireland and the Irish Government in extending my sympathies to the children, the family and friends of Baroness Thatcher, not just in Britain but across the world. <laughs> Baroness Thatcher enjoyed uh, confronting political challenges. Her legacy may be divisive, but she herself didn't shirk from that in life. But as an Irish nationalist in the democratic non-violent tradition, it would not be, it would, I will not be dishonourable but neither can I be dishonest in commenting on that, not commenting on that legacy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Mr. Connor Burns. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Monday was the day that we had all been dreading in recent months and recent years. Much has been written about the state of Lady Thatcher's health in recent years. You will remember, Mr. Speaker, only 18 months ago hosting her in your state rooms at an occasion where she came to support me in what turned out to be one of her last visits to this Palace of Westminster. And Mr Speaker, may I say she was grateful for your support and kindness to her on that occasion. She would come back from so many health scares that we sort of thought she would go on forever. In the words of the poem, if I had thought thou couldst have died, I might not weep for thee. But I forgot when by thy side that thou couldst mortal be. As I have watched the coverage of this remarkable lady on the television, I have also felt a deep sense of personal loss. Some of us have lost a dear friend and someone who in my case was not only a friend but a mentor, a protectress, someone I loved and cared for very deeply. I first met Margaret Thatcher back in 1992 in Southampton Itchen, the then constituency of my honourable friend and neighbour, the member for Christchurch, when she came to support him. And over the years, she has been enormously supportive 
in my efforts to get elected to this place. I remember in 2001 when she came to support me in Eastleigh and we took her to a health club covered live on Sky News. The chief executive of the entire group had come to welcome her and she announced to him that these places are a complete waste of time. <laughs> Up and down stairs keeps me fit. <laughs> in, uh, in 2002, Mr Speaker, I must have had the unique privilege of welcoming Ted Heath and Margaret Thatcher to Eastleigh in the same month and I warned the people in my association when Ted was coming, for goodness sake don't put out the Thatcher Tebbit flyers. Well they did. And Ted reached for one of them and looked at it and said to me, what on earth are you doing with those two? And I said, well they, they agreed to come. And he came to say what I suppose for him was a grudging compliment. Well I suppose it's something of a coup. <laughs> she came down to Eastly again in 2005. Alas, that was not to be, and, and Chris Hoon won. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in, January, in January 2010, in the run up to the general election, she did what turned out to be uh, the last dinner she ever had outside her home or uh, the Ritz, where she came to do an event for me and another candidate. Uh, which we rather novelly entitled uh, Women for Men to Win. <laughs> Anne Widdicombe was the guest speaker and Margaret was the guest of honour. But Mr Speaker, it is, I think, the Sunday evenings that I spent with Lady Thatcher in recent years. Almost every Sunday. I often bumped into you, Mr Speaker, on my way to Chester Square to see her where you were returning from the gym. We had a <laughs> very... Um, we had great conversations on those Sundays and they ranged very much dependent on how she was on a particular day. If we were in good form we'd go through the papers and we'd have a look at what was in them. I remember last November uh, showing her a poll in the Sunday Telegraph that showed the Conservatives 9% behind the Labour Party. Uh, she asked when the next election was. I said it was a little over two years to go. And she said, that's not far enough behind at this stage. <laughs> I did indeed. <laughs> I did indeed from the living room of Chester Square text this piece of information to the Prime Minister. I don't know whether that cheered up his Sunday evening at Chequers. I'm sure it reduced my prospects of promotion. <laughs> Mr Speaker, there was one occasion when I took a taxi from here to Chester Square to see her. It was a particularly wet and awful evening. And I asked the taxi driver to take me to Chester Square and he said, which end of the square do you want, Gov? I said, the one, the house with the policeman outside. Maggie Thatcher's Gov. I said, that's right. He said, what are you doing there then? I said, I'm going to have a drink with her. She's a friend of mine. What do you do then? I said, I'm a Tory MP. And as we pulled up, I went to pay the fare and he refused to take the fare. And I apologise in advance to the Prime Minister for repeating this story. Um, he said, your fare tonight, Gov, as you go in there, and you tell her from me, we ain't had a good one since. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I imparted, I imparted this message to Margaret, who looked at me and said, well, he's quite right. <laughs> I then was on the receiving end of a lecture about how he probably had a wife and child to support and I should have paid him and it was monstrous that I didn't. <laughs> Mr Speaker, one of the things we used to talk about was her, her time in office and some of the remarkable achievements that, that she had. And I remember on one occasion, quite recently, towards the end of last year, saying to her, well you must have made mistakes. And she said, well I suppose I must have done. And I said, well, can you think of any, any specific examples? And she replied, well, they usually happen when I didn't get my own way. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, much has been made in the media about the controversial nature of Margaret Thatcher as a politician and of her premiership. And we should not shy away from that today, and nor should we on these benches be afraid to talk about that. That would be to betray who she was. She was a robust principled, 
confrontational character. Yes, she divided. Yes, she pursued her policies with vigour and with um, persistence. She believed, as she said to me, politics at its purest is philosophy in action. She believed in the battle of ideas, something that we would welcome returning to the domestic politics today. She wasn't, if I may say so, she wasn't, if I may say so, to the Deputy Prime Minister. She wasn't a Tory at all. In fact, she proudly stated that she was a laissez-faire Gladstonian economic liberal. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the proudest traditions, and I say it as one myself, of the Gladstonian Liberal Party. And she yeah. would have welcomed that. But I think, you know, the protests, in some way, are actually the greatest compliment that could be paid to Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. That even in death, the left have to argue against her. She would take great pride in these protests. She wouldn't get angry about them. She would regard them as utterly and completely absurd. And all I would say to those engaged in them, look at how gracious she was in always what she said when her political foes departed the scene, most recently in the statement that she issued about Michael Foote. Her enduring legacy is not just in what she achieved and the fact that the Labour Party haven't reversed much of it. Her true legacy lies here on these benches and those who are coming up behind us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the 2010 general election, I had the honour of organising a small number of receptions to introduce her to new colleagues. And she drew, drew great solace and comfort from the number of those colleagues who told her that they were in Parliament because of her inspiration yeah, yeah, and because yeah, of what yeah, she yeah, believed yeah. and did. Even only two years ago, Tony Abbott, the aspirant Prime Minister of Australia, asking to come and see her and telling her that his philosophy was informed by watching what she had done when he was at university. Mr Speaker, I want to end with this, because while she was a divisive to some degree, controversial certainly, she was an inspiration to many people yeah, yeah, way beyond uh, these shores. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to end by just quoting what she said in the closing pages of the second volume of her memoirs, the last uh, authentic book that she published where she reflected a visit in 1993 to Warsaw yeah, yeah, yeah. and where she wrote movingly about attending Mass at the Church of the Holy Cross. And she wrote of that occasion, every nook and cranny was packed and the choral singing of unfamiliar Polish hymns was all the more uplifting because I could not understand the verses. It forced me to try to imagine what the congregation was asking of God. Foreign though this experience was, it also gave me a comforting feeling that I was but one soul among many in a fellowship of believers that crossed nations and denominations. When the priest rose to give the sermon, however, I had the sense that I had suddenly become the centre of attention. Heads turned and people smiled at me. As the priest began, someone translated his words. He recalled that during the dark days of communism, they had been aware of voices from the outside world, offering hope of a different and better life. The voices were many, often eloquent, and all were welcome to a people starved so long of truth as well as freedom. But Poles had come to identify with one voice in particular, my own. Even when that voice had been relayed through the distorting loudspeaker of the Soviet propaganda, they had heard through the distortions the message of truth and hope. Well, communism had fallen and a new democratic order had replaced it, but they had not fully felt the change nor truly believed in its reality until today when they finally saw me in their own church. The priest finished his sermon at the, and the service continued, but the, but the kindness of the priest and the parishioners had not been exhausted. At the end of Mass, I was invited to stand in front of the altar. When I did so, lines of children presented me with little bouquets while their mothers and fathers applauded. Mr. Speaker, the final paragraph of Lady Thatcher's memoirs reads thus. Of course, no, hu of course, no human mind, nor any conceivable computer, can calculate the sum total of my career in politics in terms of happiness, achievement and virtue nor indeed of their opposites. It follows, therefore, that the full accounting of how my political work 
affected the lives of others is something we will only know on Judgment Day. It is an awesome and unsettling thought, but it comforts me that when I stand up to hear the verdict, I will at least have the people of the Church of the Holy Cross in Warsaw in court as character witnesses. Sir Gerald Kaufman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I join in paying tribute to my old adversary, Margaret Thatcher. For many, of course, Margaret Thatcher was synonymous with milk snatcher, and it would be idle to pretend that to us in the Labour Party and to millions of our supporters, many of her policies were other than anathema. But Margaret was much more complex than that, both as a politician and as a person. And her international significance was emphasised quite recently when almost 24 years after she had stopped being Prime Minister, an actress in Hollywood could win, win the Best Actress Award Oscar for portraying her almost as well as she used to portray herself. <laughs> I served in the Shadow Cabinet for 10 years when she was Prime Minister. I saw her in action and I often opposed her in action. After she left office, or rather was ousted from office by some of her colleagues, I had contact with her from time to time. Of course, as a Labour Member of Parliament, I deplored many of the drastic changes that she made in society. I was Labour's front bench spokesman in the coal strike, which she provoked and prepared for and won, though she was greatly helped by the stupid approach of Arthur Scargill, who destroyed the, uh, the once almost revered National Union of Mine Workers by refusing to hold a, uh, a, a stri strike uh, ballot. A victory for her, just as, and we have had reference to him this afternoon, uh, Michael Foote, just as Michael Foote contributed very significantly indeed to her greatest election victory in 1983. It was my job to oppose her right to buy legislation, <coughs> whose impact on the availability of social housing persists to this day. And that's quite a charge sheet, not to mention the blunders that finished her off, the poll tax, and no, no, no to Europe. But after all, she was a Tory Prime Minister and was not elected to implement policies that I or my constituents favoured. Unlike Winston Churchill or Harold Macmillan or Ted Heath, she broke the post-war consensus and that was her objective and that was her achievement. In personal relationships and in some policy areas, she could be more than civilised, indeed punctilious and cordial. I was a junior housing minister when she was shadow environment secretary. I recall an occasion when one of her front bench spokesmen violated the kind of across-the-floor front bench deal on which the functioning of this house depends. It was Margaret who sought me out to apologise and to say that she nothing, knew nothing about it and would have stopped it had she known. After she became Prime Minister, she balked at railway privatisation. It was imposed by John Major and it's got messy consequences we suffer to this day. She was, although she won her second and third elections with enormous majorities, she was always accessible. She announced that any member of parliament with employment problems in his or her constituency could come and see her at number 10. And I availed myself of this offer when a computer multi-layer board factory in my constituency was at hazard. We met in the Prime Minister's study uh, in 10 Downing Street and I explained the problem. But how are we to save it, she asked. I suggested it could be taken over by the National Enterprise Board, which had been created by Labour. Kenneth Baker, who was the junior minister responsible for this area of policy, was present. And she turned to him and asked plaintively, Kenneth, what did I do with the National Enterprise Board? <laughs> 
Uh, I'm sorry to say that the factory is a now, now a blood transfusion centre, but still she meant well. She, she was brave. <coughs> in the parliamentary week following the Brighton bombing, in which terrorists tried to kill her and all her cabinet and British democracy by seeking to do so, she came here. She was present, bright and perky in the House of Commons, for the government statement to which, as it happened, I responded. She was absolutely right on a considerable number of foreign policy issues against timorous nerve trembling on both sides of the house and attempted international in interference. She was utterly determined that the people of the Falkland Islands who wanted to be British and who still want to be British today should not be the, should not be the victims of a fascist dictator. How some Labour members of Parliament could actually want to water down a response to an aggressive fascist dictator, I could not understand then and I still not, un do not understand today. Was that when Saddam Hussein seized Kuwait, she was actively part of the preparations to oust him by force. I was Shadow Foreign Secretary at this time, and having to seek to carry with me uh, some of our own backbenchers, some of, some of whom were spineless. <laughs> I'm here to try to obtain a consensus, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker. But I, in the debate at which she was present, told the House that Labour policy was based not on supporting the United Kingdom government, but on implementing United Nations Security Council resolutions. She knew what I, I was up to, dug the Foreign Secretary in the ribs with her elbow, and smiled a wry smile. She was much more far-sighted than most United Kingdom Prime Ministers about rightward trends in Israel and the Middle East. When a Shadow Foreign Secretary, I visited Morocco, I was told by the United Kingdom Ambassador there that she gave him a direct instruction to approach the leaders of the then substantial Moroccan Jewish community and urge them to exhort the very sizable numbers of Moroccan Jewish immigrants in Israel to vote Labour uh, uh, in a forthcoming election. That was Shimon Peres. Until her final debacle, she generally found ways of getting her own way. There had been a Lionel Bar musical called Maggie May, and the saying went, others may not, but Maggie may, and that was very much her watchword. I saw her from time to time after she left office. On one occasion I attended a social event, and when I came in she bustled over to me. I'd recently had published in a newspaper an article about protecting children for po from pornography on TV and videos. She told me how much she admired the article and said, I carry it with me everywhere in my handbag. Mr. Speaker, to be part of the contents of marvelous... <laughs> To be part of the contents of Margaret's handbag, what greater apotheosis could one possibly hope for? Sir Gerald Howarth. Mr Speaker, this is a sad day uh, for those of us who were privileged to serve as either officers or, in my case, as a foot soldier in Margaret Thatcher's great army. But as the Leader of the Opposition said in what I thought was a very generous speech, this is also an opportunity for the nation to pause, reflect and recall the extraordinary achievements she secured in just 11 years. And when she won the 1979 election, uh, many of my colleagues uh, were not around uh, at the time to remember, they're so young, 
Uh, but we, we uh, older ones, do remember the rubbish piled up in the streets, the corpses that went unburied, and in industry which was being held to ransom by the likes of Red Robbo. And so Britain was basically a basket case, a chance to check a recall from an aeroplane Heathrow to come and answer the IMF. And so she arrived as a new breed, not just a woman, but as the Prime Minister said, a conviction politician who was driven by a belief that Britain deserved better and that the British people themselves deserve better. Uh, she didn't need a focus group, I have to say, to uh, decide what she believed in. She was driven by a set of very clear conservative principles, underpinned by a fundamental belief that it would be free enterprise which delivered the prosperity that she so craved for our people in the aftermath of the Second World War and the malaise which the Prime Minister made reference. Uh, when I became a Shadow Minister in 2002, I got, of course, a handwritten note uh, congratulating me and uh, saying, uh, know your facts. And so, Mr. Speaker, in that spirit, uh, I am going to just remind the House of a couple of facts. Um, she believed in sound money, as the Prime Minister said, and in her time, the public sector borrowing requirement fell from 4.1% of GDP to 1%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The national debt was cut from 43.6% to 26.7% of GDP. And she took on the trade union barons and restored the trade unions to their members. And it's very interesting to look at the figures. There were in, two, in 1979 29.8 million days lost in industrial action or strikes to you and me. Uh, that was cut by the time she left office to 2 million. And last year it was less than 250,000 days. Such has the change that this divisive woman has wrought in industrial relations in our country. She also abolished exchange controls. I once went on a demonstration when I was running the Society for Individual Freedom. I went on a demonstration outside the Bank of England with a placard saying end exchange controls. This was about 1972. didn't really understand exactly what it was all about. I hadn't done a part on my banking, banking career, but I had some sort of vague notion that it was a sort of uh, ghastly sort of uh, Second World War regulation. And uh, the first thing that she did, or Geoffrey Howe did, when he became Chancellor of Exchequer, he abolished exchange controls. And for those of our young people who don't understand, uh, like I didn't, what we're talking about, in those days, when you went abroad, you, had to, you were allowed to take 30 quid out of the country, and you had to have your passport stamped saying you were entitled to take 30 quid out of the country. And uh, so uh, it, is in, it is important that we take this opportunity to remind people of the changes uh, that have been wrought. Uh, I was in a, a bank, working in the bank at the time. I took all those um, regulations uh, from exchange controls. I took them all off the, the shelves. I have them at home to remind myself and anybody else who might also need reminding uh, of the iniquity of exchange controls. Uh, she also ended the party line, which was not the, of course, uh, line from central office um, every morning that we are so privileged to receive. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the party line, again, I remind some of those who are um, uh, slightly younger. We had a party line at home. It meant that your telephone, which was graciously provided by something called the General Post Office, and you picked up your telephone, and if your neighbour with whom you shared a party line was on the phone, you put your phone down. <laughs> and I remember in the I, I remember in the 90, I remember in the, the late 1990s, all, all those smart suited Armani suited uh, um, new Labour types clutching their mobile phones. Don't forget, friends, comrades, if it hadn't been for us privatising the telecommunications industry, you wouldn't have had your mobile phone. <laughs> Had a chance to phone a friend. Trouble is, he hasn't got, he hasn't got one. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit divisive. Um, but also, <laughs> and we've heard uh, her other achievements uh, domestic. She wasn't always, she didn't do everything. And the No Turning Back group, and of course, we, uh, my run on friend for Hitchin Harpenden and, uh, uh, and uh, my run friend for Wokingham and many others in the No Turning Back group, were urging on her to go further and faster. 
uh, and uh, we were called the Don't Turn Your Back group for some obscure reason. But we did urge her to go further. And I remember we, we put to her a proposal that we might, in education, have a system whereby the money followed the pupil. Uh, and she uh, told us at this uh, NTB dinner, she said, grow up boys and be your age, we can't possibly do anything like that. So we were all crestfallen and um, went home thinking, well, this is very disappointing, the Prime Minister hasn't listened. Well, come the general election, 1987, you know, out there canvassing all day long, you turn on the telly at night, see what's going on at the centre. There's a press conference in the morning, the Prime Minister in the middle, and uh, Ken Baker to her side. And she said, and Ken, tell, we've got this new idea about education. The money follows the pupil. <laughs> and I said, but that's what we proposed to her. And she told us to grow up, we couldn't possibly do anything like it. And that was the art of Margaret Thatcher's uh, political argument of which the Prime Minister spoke. <laughs> that she did challenge you. And she did make sure that you got your facts right. And she challenged that and she found that it was a policy worth pursuing. Abroad, of course, she forged that close relationship with Ronald Reagan in the United States, a story which my uh, uh, right on learned friends uh, mentioned about Ronald Reagan. Is, uh, I heard it from Bob Tuttle, the former American ambassador, absolutely right. They really did admire, admire her. She was no poodle to the United States, though. She challenged them, and that's what they admired about her. And she did end the Cold War, and I think it's terribly important that we do understand that at that time we all felt a sense of potential nuclear holocaust Absolutely. and together with Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev they made the world a better place and liberated millions of Eastern Europeans who had been subjected to tyranny. So again this divisive lady responsible for introducing harmony across the Iron Curtain and that will to recover the uh, Falkland Islands is now legendary and I wear with pride my Falkland Islands tie today as a symbol of that uh, determination by Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> and that, uh, that extraordinary uh, engendering of a new respect across the world for the United Kingdom had commercial advantage. One of the biggest deals that was ever done was the Al Yamama uh, defence deal with Sa the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, which today is worth tens of billions of pounds sustaining high-tech jobs across the kingdom. And she had a huge part to play in that. And many people believe, if they remember, she went there observing yeah. all the, uh, all the uh, courtesies of the Arab world, long dress, long sleeves, scarf. Uh, but I'm quite sure that when she flashed her eyes at uh, King Fahad, it was all a done deal. Uh, and the liberation of Kuwait, of which we've heard again, and the winning of the EU rebate, uh, and uh, that's, uh, again, in structure, she had a simple message. That was one of her secrets. She had a simple message uh, for the country. And do you remember Robin Day had that interview with her and said, um, gave a long thing about how all her, her, her belligerence was going to uh, off-put our European partners over the her determination to get the rebate. And she paused and said, after this great spiel, she paused and said, but Robin, it's our money. We want it back. <laughs> to date, £75 billion pounds we got back. Yeah. So let no one deny her the pomp and circumstance of next week's yeah. 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 Um, Of course, she did fall out over Europe. Um, and she did sign the Single European Act, as on member for Belfast North uh, mentioned. I didn't uh, uh, sign it, I wasn't a minister, but I did actually vote against it at third reading. Uh, and I did say to her, uh, when I was, uh, became her PPS, uh, I said, a lot of people in the House are saying, Margaret, that your belligerence on, uh, on Europe uh, is hardly justified when you signed the Single European Act. And she said to me, yes, I did sign it. But I understood it to apply solely to the single market in goods and services. And what I, I was assured that it wouldn't be extended to, uh, 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 to working, uh, working time and other areas. And it was that I was betrayed, the fact that I was betrayed. That is why I feel so passionately about it. And she was a fervent patriot. She profoundly believed in this country. She loved this country. And she did not wish to sign up to a United States of Europe, and nor do I, and nor do my right on more and honourable friends on this side. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but of course we weren't alone in that. I remember a conversation. This was not seen by any of the media. This was just uh, myself, uh, Lady Thatcher, Mrs Thatcher, as she then was, uh, the, uh, 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 Mr Ben, Tony Ben, and the Honourable Member for Bolsover. 
and it was absolutely marvellous hearing the entire expression of unity about how evil, as it were, the common market was in the way that it was trying to drive the single, uh, the single market, the uh, United States of Europe. So she, she lost office. I was her parliamentary private secretary after she lost office. She was angry. Uh, people around the world couldn't understand it. And it's important to remember, she was never beaten by the British people. She was never even beaten by the Conservative Party. 54% of us voted for her, but it was four votes short of the majority that was required. And I do think the Conservative Party and the country suffered in consequence uh, of that. Uh, and I congratulate my uh, right hon. the Prime Minister in doing all that he can uh, to try to uh, revive those Thatcherite principles uh, that did so much to revive our country in the 1980s. Uh, I will tell you one story, Mr. Speaker, if you, uh, and, and then I, I will wind up. But I, I must tell you this a wonderful story. I um, went down to see her after I lost my seat uh, in, in Staffordshire. And um, I said, what are you doing this weekend, Margaret? This is 1992. And she said, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to Paris. I'm going to have dinner with uh, President Mitterrand. I said, uh, what, are you, what are you going to say? He says, I'm going to tell him that if France signs the Maastricht Treaty, France air more. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I think, actually, it's La France. Yes, yes. So she said, La France, c'est more. I think, well, because it's m La France, you have to say mort. <laughs> so she went round the room saying, La France, c'est mort. La France, c'est mort. So she went off to dinner uh, with President Mitterrand uh, on the, that weekend. And it is no coincidence, in my view, that on Monday morning, President Mitterrand announced that France would hold a referendum on the Maastricht Treaty. <laughs> The eyes of Caligula and the mouth of Marilyn Monroe, maybe. Um, I was told that if I didn't distance myself from Margaret Thatcher uh, after losing my seat in 1992 in Cannock and Birchwood, uh, that I would never get a seat again. Exactly. Uh, however, I had a wonderful letter from Enoch Powell, who said, My dear Gerald, hard luck would be of good cheer. Fidelity to persons or to principles is seldom unrewarded. Thank you to the people of Aldershot, who rewarded me by offering me the first seat that came up after the 1992 general election. And I think that that rather um, worried number 10 at the time. But I have not changed my principles. I have um, been a supporter of Margaret Thatcher from the very first time that she put her name forward to be leader of our party. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I do not regret that. I think she has been the salvation of the nation. Yeah, yeah. I think she has restored our position in the world. And I, none of us can um, uh, forget her extraordinary elegance. Uh, I remember coming to the chamber about four o'clock in the morning, all night sitting. None of you lot know what an all night sitting is all about. <laughs> well, we used to have it regularly. <laughs> to, to four o'clock in the morning, and you'd had a bit to drink, and you've got that feeling, us chaps, you know, a bit of stubble, and, and it was really pretty unpleasant. You know, sitting on the front bench over there, wondering when is this all going to end, is purgatory. And then there was a free on the back of the chair, all of a sudden. In walked the Prime Minister, not a hair out of place, handbag there, smiling, and you sort of slid up your bench and looked at the Prime Minister, here I am. Uh, she was an inspiration to us all. She inspired huge loyalty. Bob Kingston, her personal protection officer, once said to me when I asked him what it was like working for her, he said, uh, I would catch bullets between my teeth to save that woman. Uh, the, the soldiers uh, whom she so admired, they reciprocated and they admired her. I was at the Painted Hall for the 25th anniversary of the Falklands campaign. A lot of people who had uh, been injured mentally or physically were there. When Margaret Thatcher got up to leave, there was the most astonishing roar from men who had been maimed, cheering their warrior leader who had instructed them to go into battle. And they wanted to pay their tribute to her. And she showed immense kindness, as people have said. In my case, when Neil Hamilton and I faced extinction after we were defamed by the BBC Panorama programme, uh, it took a bit of time to see the chairman of the party, happened to be Norman Tebbit, but it took only a couple of days to see the Prime Minister. For, for 25 minutes she listened. At the end, she said, turned to the Chief Whip, John Wakeham, and said, these are members of our party in good standing. Please ensure that they get the necessary support. Yeah, yeah. We got that support. We won our libel action, and the, and the uh, director general of the BBC was fired as a result uh, um, of Margaret Thatcher's kindness. Uh, I think that we were able to 
resume our political careers here. Mr Speaker, uh, I will close by uh, quoting from um, Enoch Powell, because he, at the time of the Falklands campaign, he made a very uh, interesting observation. Uh, before the campaign, he said that the Iron Lady was going to be tested. And then on the 17th of June, he said to the Prime Minister, is the Right Honourable Lady aware that the report has now been received from the public analyst on a certain substance recently subjected to analysis, and that I have obtained a copy of the report? It shows that the substance under test consisted of ferrous matter of the highest quality, that it is of exceptional tensile strength, is highly resistant to wear and tear and to stress, and may be used with advantage for all national purposes. What advantage she had in the leadership of Margaret Thatcher, the greatest peacetime Prime Minister this nation has ever seen, and next week we will have our opportunity to give her the send-off that she so fully deserves yeah. for her selfless sacrifice to the nation. Yeah. Michael Meacher. I uh, very much endorse the uh, measured and dignified remarks of uh, my right honourable friend, the leader of the uh, opposition, and I just want very uh, briefly to add to them in two ways. Uh, first and most important, I want to be a voice uh, for my constituents, and I also want to speak as someone who has been a member of this House from the very start uh, when uh, Margaret Thatcher first became Conservative Party leader and then Prime Minister. Now I think almost everyone uh, agrees that in 1979 Britain was set on a course which could not go on and demanded radical change. At times of deep crisis, I think the whole country rallies behind a unifying leader. Whether it is Churchill in wartime or Attlee in peacetime, constructing a peace which breaks with the despair of the 1930s. But Mrs Thatcher was a very different kind of leader. She was someone who took the fight to her opponents, who deployed a scorched earth policy to destroy them, which polarised the country, which is why even still today she is lionised in the South, as we have heard repeatedly this afternoon, but remembered with a very different memorial in the North. The task in 1979 certainly required a dominant personality to shake this country out of its somnolent conservatism. I think we all agree. And whatever else, Mrs Thatcher was certainly a dominant figure. She dominated, or came to dominate her cabinet, uh, her party, the country, and her influence was indeed felt across much of the world. Uh, and in that context, I would uh, recall a story I recently heard uh, when I was sharing a speech with my very good friend, uh, John Gummer, uh, now Lord Daben. Uh, he, Daben, may, maybe I got the pronunciation wrong. Uh, he uh, was complaining uh, because as Environment Secretary in the 1980s, he couldn't get his department uh, to take climate change seriously. Uh, so he rang uh, Mrs Thatcher, as she then was, uh, in order to ensure that he had the necessary support. Yeah. And when he had explained, uh, Mrs Thatcher said to him, John, you really shouldn't worry. There are two persons in the Cabinet who are committed over climate change, you and me, so we're in a majority. <laughs> but dominance should always have a counterpart in concern for the victims of radical change. One should never destroy without then building up again. And too many industries, too many working class communities across the North were laid waste during those years without any alternative and better future being constructed to replace what had been lost. And many of those are still desolated today. In Oldham, the text industry was wiped out and a whole swathe of some of the country's finest engineering companies uh, were simply swept away. Yes, I think we agree on these benches that change, even painful change, is often necessary. 
but it should not be bought at the price of the tripling of unemployment, the tripling of child poverty, and the rise of an unacceptable increase in inequality which is still with us today. My office in Oldham received, and I'm sure many other members did as well, dozens and dozens of phone calls and emails uh, from uh, my constituents. And I just want to quote one of them in the exact words of her email. And this is what she said. Despite what her supporters think, a lot of today's problems result from her policies. The destruction of our manufacturing base, the lack of investment in social housing following the sale of council homes, deregulating the banking industry, privatised industries profiteering at our expense. We are still living with the consequences. And then she went on, I'm sure a large percentage of the population who lived through her years in power will feel the same. And she ended, I hope that my views will be represented in Parliament today. Now Lady, Lady Thatcher will undoubtedly be remembered uh, as a leader of great conviction, there is no doubt about this. But greatness, in my view, has to be tempered with generosity and magnanimity if one is to earn a permanent place in the heart of this nation. And I simply conclude by saying this. That same unwavering conviction which she possessed so magnificently, I think sets an example for every generation in confronting the problems that challenge them. And this generation is confronted by very different problems today. Uh, the straitjacket of prolonged austerity, the lack of accountability of corporate power, the overdominance of finance, a grossly unjust system of remuneration, and the destruction of the public realm. But it is to Lady Thatcher's credit and I mean this very genuinely and forcefully, that she has shown us that we should not be daunted by problems uh, on this scale and magnitude, but we should tackle them head on and indeed overcome them with the same flame of conviction and resolution which remains her greatest memorial. This is Gerald Gillard. Mr Speaker, the legion of tributes today, the international response and even the distasteful celebrations of her sad death mark out Margaret Thatcher from all other politicians in this country. But it's also remarkable to note that she was only the second woman on the Conservative benches to ever serve at Cabinet level, which makes her achievements even more impressive. She was a woman of great contrasts. I think of her, you can say she bestrode the world stage like a colossus. But she was also capable of great empathy and compassion. A woman who was not only a politician, but proud of her role as daughter, wife, mother and grandmother. And our thoughts in this house should be with her family and her close relatives today. I'm afraid I came into this house, Mr. Speaker, um, just as she left. So it is with great sadness uh, that I never got to serve on these green benches alongside her. And for me, she was a sort of cross between my mother and my headmistress. Uh, she was a woman to be loved and admired, but also feared. A woman to hold up as an example for others, but who would expect you to follow her. <coughs> For someone with a reputation of wanting to be the only woman in the cabinet room, I found that she was both inspiring and personally encouraging to other women, particularly those that wanted to enter politics. It was as a direct result of her comments to me as I sat next to her at a dinner back in 1979 that she made me believe I too could serve my country as an MP. And I think from some of the speeches we've heard today and those that will follow later, we will know that she had that sort of effect on many people, empowering them to achieve their full potential. But it was also that clearly defined philosophy and that stubborn adherence to her own beliefs that fashioned the opinions of both her admirers and her detractors. 
Now, my predecessor in Cheshire and Amersham was one such detractor, calling his book on the Thatcher years Dancing with Dogma to reflect her often intractable views and approach. But even he praised her attention to detail and her mastery of the brief, even if he did not admire her footwork on the political dance floor. Although, almost unbelievably, she had moments of self-doubt, she reserved those for the private arena and mostly to be shared with her devoted and doted on Dennis. On public platforms, she always appeared sure-footed and brave with it. Politics takes no prisoners, Mr. Speaker, man or woman, and being Prime Minister is no easy sinecure. As an individual, I think she was braver than many men. She took on the vested interests, the dictators and the misogynists, and triumphed. She engineered the end of a Cold War and against all odds won a distant one. She curtailed the powers of the unelected unions and restored it to elected representatives. She removed the dead hand of the state from enterprise and helped people improve their lot and their lives through hard work and home ownership. And she established the United Kingdom's ground quite clearly and uniquely in a Europe that had its own grandiose ambitions to usurp our British sovereignty. Any one of those feats would have been enough to mark out an individual, but these and many more reflect a politician of substance whose like we may not see again in our lifetime. She will be missed in very many different ways by all who knew her, but especially by those who received her encouragement and kindness and protection. She has left an indelible impression on this country and abroad and on all future generations. Yeah. Yeah. Diane Abbott. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak in this historic debate this afternoon. And it would be wrong not to pay tribute to Britain's first woman Prime Minister. But I would also say this, I was, I um, entered Parliament in 1987 when Mrs Thatcher was still Prime Minister in all her pomp and glory and it's fair to say that she was a remarkable parliamentary phenomenon. She believed in Parliament as the cockpit of political debate in a way perhaps that is not fashionable today and she was often the leading lady, whether you agreed with her or not, of some of Parliament's most momentous occasions. The House will not be surprised to hear that I did not agree with many of the things she stood for. But I don't rise in the chamber this afternoon to challenge her beliefs, but to remind the House very gently, that even all these years after she stood down as leader of her party, there were millions of people up and down the country who felt themselves to be on the wrong side of the titanic battles that she fought. Whether it was people who felt the poll tax was imposed on them wrongly, whether it was young people who were caught up in the difficult relationships between police and community in our inner cities, whether it was people who were dismayed by our unwillingness to impose economic sanctions on South Africa and dismayed as well by her insistence on calling the ANC a terrorist organisation, or whether it was people that were caught up in the, and I mean communities, mm. that were caught up in the miners' strike. Mm. There are still people living today who felt themselves on the wrong side of those titanic struggles. And this House should not give the appearance that their voice cannot be heard. Yeah. Yes. There are many members here from mining communities and they will have their say. But I will just quote from another Conservative leader, Harold Macmillan, and he spoke on the miners' strike when he made his very first speech in the House of Lords as, as Lord Stockton, and he said this, 
It breaks my heart to see, and I cannot interfere, what is happening in our country today. This terrible strike by the best men in the world who beat the Kaisers and Hitler's armies and never gave in. And whatever the rights and wrongs of the titanic political struggles which she fought and members on the other side have spoken about them at length, let us remember that for some of those communities, in their hearts, they never gave in and they deserve to have a voice in the House this afternoon. I'm happy to pay tribute to her historic significance and her historic role and I know that history is written by victors, but those of us that came of age in the Thatcher era know there was another side to the glories that members opposite have spoken about.